Welcome to the Counting Capital Podcast, presented by Buchanan Street Partners. Join our host, Buchanan Street Chairman, Robert Brunswick. Welcome to our Counting Capital Podcast. Robert Brunswick, Chairman of Buchanan. It's my great pleasure today to have Rick Keller with us. Rick is the Chairman of First Foundation. We're going to have a uh, rich and content conversation with Rick today about his career, about the evolution of First Foundation, and uh, I know you're going to enjoy it. So with that, welcome, Rick. It's nice to have you, uh, you on board Pleased today. To be here. We appreciate the time. And uh, I think it would be most appropriate to start off with a little bit about your your business career. So okay. have, have the group, the audience, get to know you a little bit as uh, we introduce you to everyone. Okay. Well, uh, investing was kind of a hobby through high school and, uh, and beyond. And uh, I uh, got my degree in finance because I liked investments. And... Um, went into corporate accounting and went and heard a financial planner speak one day and I decided that's what I want to do and uh, um, I went and told my professor that I wanted to do that and he said you should become a CFP so I had enrolled in USC's program and being one of the better students the instructor asked me to come work for him and I ended up down here in Newport Beach working with him in 1983 and uh, uh, and then subsequent, I decided that I didn't like the ethical commission conflict that uh, went on. And so I decided in 1987 to go fee only. So when you say financial planning or planner, uh-huh. what does that mean to you as you describe that uh, broadly? Sure. Uh, financial planning is kind of like the quarterback uh, of all financial aspects of a person's life. Great. So that means... Uh, uh, passing a, an exam on estate planning, on income tax, on casualty type insurance, on life insurance, and then uh, retirement planning and projections, and then uh, investments, which ultimately is probably the most important to most people. Perfect. So let's go back to you. In 1987, it was a commission-oriented business. You didn't care for that because you thought there was maybe misalignment. I don't want to put words in your mouth. And you wanted to go to more of a, tell us the, the, uh, what so made you I, change. I went fee only in 87 because prior to the stock market crash, interest rates were hitting highs. And I had moved 40% of my clients' portfolios into CDs at 10%. And Those I wasn't the getting days. paid. <laughs> I wasn't getting paid. And uh, I decided, well, the, the step to fee only wasn't very far. And the market crash occurred when I had 40% in cash. So I were in CDs. And... Um, so my clients made out real well, and I decided after that uh, that I'd go uh, fee only, and and uh, off I off I went. So before we get into specifics of the company today, I'd like so do you consider yourself an entrepreneur, or do you consider yourself an investment manager? And I'm sure you're going to probably say both at some degree because you really have started a business, built a very significant business with your team but your day-to-day job is investment management. So yes. help reconcile that for us. Ultimately, an entrepreneur with good ideas has to execute those ideas and really build these into good businesses. And that's what I realized. So first going fee only and and uh, financially, it was uh, uh, quite a, a difficult uh, period to get up to speed because it meant hiring good people. And I was paying everybody, including the secretary, more than me. As new assets come in on a fee-only business, um, you're building that, that base. And you, you have a book of business or a book of clients that it's just important for them to remain with you in year 10 it is it, as it is in year one. And unlike a commission-orientated business where you're always looking for the next client. And so my business was to bring in clients, keep them happy for lifelong. So I'm hearing a little bit more, to do that, you have to be a good investment manager. You have to provide good returns, predictable returns, not take too much risk and and hold the hand of your clients. Because clients can fire you at any time without any cost or obligation. So um, when I first started, there were probably only three of us in Orange County. So today, today it's a mainstay, but... So, so let's kind of go there for a second, if you, if you can. So First Foundation today, uh-huh. uh, when did it start? First Foundation started? So this, this corporation we founded January 1st, 1990. Okay, so that's now, what is that, uh, almost 
30 Good. plus years. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So what, um, you, you obviously today are a bank, you're an investment management business. So describe what First Foundation is today. So, so uh, we enjoyed a lot of success through uh, the early years. And along about 2005, I had six banks come offer to buy us and we weren't for sale. And I happened to be having lunch with somebody, uh, Scott Cavanaugh, and uh, um, I, I said, Scott, we've had six banks come offer to buy us and we're not for sale. And he said, Rick, why don't you start your own bank and I'll be the CEO. And I looked to my partner, John Okopian, who huh. uh, has been with me uh, all these years. And, and I said, boy, we didn't think of that. So we embarked on this, uh, uh, campaign to start the bank. So uh, we put up all the starting capital and then uh, uh, we had to raise money for investors and we converted, unlike a lot of people, we converted all our equity at the same price as all in other investors. So we didn't want to be at a price point advantage for we're asking our clients to come in. So we converted at $10 a, a share. We've since split two for one. Sure. And uh, uh, we capitalized the bank in two that, October 1st, 2007. We opened uh, the bank with about $32 million in capital. And all of a sudden, we're rolling into this god-awful recession. But fortunately, we had no loans to go bad. And we found ourselves being the healthiest bank on the West Coast for the next four years. So when you talk about recessions, you're talking about 90s recessions, or are you talking uh, about 2007? 2008. Okay, got it. So we eight. opened it in 2008. Got it. Uh, or 2007, October 1st, 2007, and the economy as it slid, all of a sudden the doors ringing on on uh, employees and professionals we could hire, where it was very difficult in 2007 to hire anybody. And, so a uh, good time to differentiate yourself, build a bank, retain human talent. Because we needed to put our capital to work, and we ended up buying uh, 60 or 55 million in uh, mortgages from Citigroup. And so, and that was around August of 2008, and our revenue went bing, you know, so we we're moving 55 million overnight from Fed funds that was near zero to about five and a quarter, and uh, we were off to the races. So, so today you're a bank, probably uh, north of $11 billion in assets. That's correct. And you're an investment management business yes. with about $5 an billion RIA. of assets. Yeah, $5 billion. RIA. So those are distinct, different businesses. Yeah. Uh, so, yeah, But we have a holding company at the top, and the holding company we took public. Uh, it was kind of a soft uh, offering in 2014, and then in 2000. Uh, 15, uh, we raised capital and really increased the uh, uh, trading volume in the stocks. So. so for everyone that is watching here, I'm curious how you might describe a fiduciary. Because certainly you have a definite fiduciary responsibility with your investment management business. Yes. And I'd argue within your banking business also. Yeah. I mean, that's just a part of the job criteria, if you will. Yeah. But how do you kind of manage that as you think about conflicts within your world, just to yeah, kind of touch it? That's a good question. It? So as an RA, Registered Investment Advisor, you are a fiduciary from, for your clients under the law, meaning you can only do what's best for your clients um, in terms of any transaction uh, with them. And so that means just full disclosure on everything. But as a, the founder of the company, for instance, I have a conflict if somebody opens a bank account, for instance, because I'm one of the largest shareholders. Um, if somebody takes out a loan through us, um, there's a conflict there. Uh, and so the, we have to disclose that to clients that we, because we're owner shareholders of uh, the parent company and their sister company, so the the holding company owns both corporations. Uh, uh, we have to disclose that uh, conflict sure. to clients. So, as you're characterizing that, and that makes sense, you're obviously a registered investment advisor, so you're overseen by the SEC. So, with that being said, though, I imagine there are some benefits to your clients, and that's probably one of the driving reasons you started the bank. Yes. For, for your investment yes. management clients. So uh, early on, uh, clients would come in and sometimes, because most clients had all their assets with us, so they never qualified for private banking services at their own bank institution 
outside of us. So once we had our own bank, then we were able to provide a different level of service for them in terms of their banking. And uh, uh, we had offered stock to our clients, our largest clients, and uh, I didn't want anybody that was retired because this is a high-risk venture. So, you know, a lot of our uh, larger clients participated and they st are still shareholders today. So, uh, but in the bank, uh, we were just able to do things that it, you couldn't get done through another bank where uh, we didn't have direct access to chief credit officers and, and others. So safety and soundness is paramount in a bank, and so we can't to do any risky loans, but we could at least take the time to explain why our client or this loan was helpful for the client. So I remember having clients where uh, they were uh, victims of fraud, for instance, and we were able to get them out of a situation that other banks had declined them. Sure. And uh, um, so it's been a big help. And, and remember, as people get more and more successful, it's about ease of life and not having problems and being able to transact things easily for them. And so, so um, it, it's, been process. A, it's been a great combination uh, for sure. us over the well, years. Well, of course, our company has a nice relationship with First Foundation. You've entrusted a number of your investment investor clients uh, with, with the Buchanan's products. So yeah. we, we greatly appreciate that. So with that, and be, I'm, I'm a client myself, I've, got a, I've had a good chance to get to see the machine work. Uh -huh. And I guess, I think for maybe the average person watching, they might think, well, how, do you, how does an investment management firm really differentiate itself? Yeah. It seems like they all tell you the same story about what products and services that they offer. But really, at the end of the day, isn't it just the market that's making these things happen? And it's really about how well they allocate. So how, how might you describe your services and your differentiated platform to a prospective uh, client? So what makes our firm different is we're both kind of the manufacturer and the distributor. So okay. if you think of, uh, let's say, the transportation industry, you can be Ford and make cars, which we have our own stock portfolios, but we're not necessarily experts in real estate, for instance, or international emerging markets or uh, high yield bonds and those kind of things. So there we become a distributor. So having the due diligence team to go out there and evaluate firms in terms of cost benefits, safety, security, and all the things. Sure. So what's paramount as a, a fiduciary of your clients is don't lose your client's money, right? So right. we want to eliminate the fraud, theft, embezzlement issues as well as the high costs that are traditionally associated with the brokerage firms. And so being a fee only, we were agnostic whether somebody invested in real estate or in municipal bonds. You know, we ch charge a flat v fee based on the value of the account. So if the account went up, our fee went up. If the account went down, our fee went down. And sure. therefore, uh, we Could were able it. to uh, grow uh, yeah. with that model. So, so uh, amazing career. I mean, a lot more to go. Um, but as you think about the favorite aspects of your job today, what do you enjoy doing most? I mean, I think I can guess your answer, but I want, to, I want you to tell everyone. No, number one has to be helping clients. Uh, sure. I've, I've had so many clients that have been with us 20, 30 years now, and uh, I've had them come in crying about how thankful they are. And so it's worked out uh, really well, but that's my joy. You know, I have a lot of... You know, most people with money, they're retirees, but I have a significant number of widows that I'm able to uh, protect. And as I tell all my clients, let us say no. Sure. Let us evaluate. Let us say no. We've had family members bring fraudulent things to clients, and we've said no. <laughs> Um, uh, because we, we, we do due diligence you know in my accounting background. Yeah. Well, having an accounting background, you know, helps a lot uh, in terms of looking at source documents and, and to evaluate statements that, that are made. Rick, I think what you've done at First Foundation and the entrepreneurial spirit and the team you've built and the, the, the metrics of accomplishments is, is, is phenomenal. But I think I would uh, ask that you're probably also very proud of your community work. I mean, I think about the endowment that you've overseen and your fiscal and financial capabilities to help an endowment here locally, or also 
just broader philanthropy, giving back. So touch upon that a little bit, because I think that rounds out the, the superstar that you are and to show some balance uh, to people listening today. Oh, thank you. Um, that's always been uh, uh, really important to my wife and I and, and the company. Um, I can remember back in the 90s when I owned 100% of the company, I'd give away about 100000 a year to local charities. And uh, I was driving a car worth about 20000 I think I sold it for twenty one. I thought, well, maybe I could afford a $100,000 car if I give away 100000 So <laughs> that, that kind of changed things a little bit. <laughs> right. But I continued to do that. But uh, once we went public... Um, a lot, it meant taking almost a 75% uh, a cut in pay uh, to grow back. So you can imagine rolling the dice and, and betting the farm on, on the next venture when we started the bank. So I, had, I was on the board of the Foreign Arts Center, and that was a 50000 a year gift. I was on the board of trustees at UCI. That was 25000 a year. So I ended up staying on UCI because I afford that, but 50000 at the Foreign Arts Center was a little high for me and nervous uh, given my uh, pay cut. And, uh, uh, but we've always given back. I was on the board of directors of the Orange County Plan Giving Council. I was in the Endowment Council at UCI, uh, Foreign Arts Center. Uh, I was involved with Hogue and, and, you know, just a bunch of charities. And so I, I, I enjoyed that and having the tax background as pretty good at uh, evaluating and, uh, and uh, you know, recommending to clients when this may be appropriate for them. Sure. So I would say it this way. Your legacy is amazing, but your, it, the legacy is still being written as you think about your life. So what does that next chapter uh, look like for, for Rick Keller? Yeah, so um, that's a good question. I, I Right now... Maybe your I, wife wants I, to know the answer. <laughs> yeah, well, my wife told me, don't come home and boss me around. So, But I, I, I consider the current chapter not over. I'm not sure. done with the, yeah. the current chapter. So I love what I do. I love helping people. Um, and uh, I discover things uh, with new clients coming in that other people missed. And, and I just love doing that, being kind of the detective and taking that, that like a, uh, a game of chess. You're trying to move the pieces around to make people better off. And uh, I love the strategy of it all. My son just joined me, so oh, now, hey. so this gives me another five years uh, to hang in there anyway. But uh, so I have no no plans to retire. Although it it'd be I have more than enough money and, and income where I could do that. But uh, I I just enjoy coming in the investment committees at seven thirty every morning. I got to. We gotta get be my, prepared. Get my fanny down the office. Get on the Bloomberg. Get all the current information. So I, I want to stay relevant. And so. can, yeah, relevance is very important as as we all look at these next chapters. So I think about my role over at UCI when I was teaching for a number of years in both the undergraduate and graduate. I just loved it, um, having influence on our next generation. So uh, a lot of our audience members today are young people just starting out in their career uh -huh. or trying to decide what what is what should they do with their career. So what advice might you give to them as you uh, have that experience level that you could tell them th some things to think about as they look forward? Um, yeah, I, I think first and foremost, uh, ethics. You need to never compromise your ethics. Be willing to stand up to people that may not have your best interest at heart. And uh, even if they're in a position of authority, be willing to stand up and uh, tell what you believe is is uh, uh, the right thing to do. Uh, the other thing is be reliable. Um, employers and everybody like people they can rely on day in, day out, year in, year out. Um, hard work. You have to be a hard work. Everybody works eight to five. If you want to be different, you got to work from five to eight. Right. <laughs> uh, That's very good. And uh, um, I. I remember being on a panel and someone said, oh, you can't possibly read all this stuff. And he was, and this was in the age a long time ago, and he was managing 30 million. And it came to me and I said, well, I manage 300 million and I read all that stuff. And so it can be done. Yogi Berra had a phrase, if there's a fork in the road, take it. And uh, um, in business, sometimes you have to be different. 
and uh, you want to be smart about it. You want to work hard, and uh, um, it, it obviously worked out for me. But uh, be diligent in your research uh, before you go off. But um, well, it's, it's sometimes very rewarding. So I think everyone is listening quite uh, intently to your great words of wisdom, and we appreciate very much your time today. And, and thank you, Rick, so much for being here. Uh, it was wonderful, and I'm sure you got some good learning today. Uh, so uh, we'll look forward to seeing you next month. Thank you very much. Thank you for joining us on this episode of the Counting Capital Podcast. To learn more about Buchanan Street Partners, please visit our website at buchananstreet.com. Buchanan Street Partners. Capital you can count on.